Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is entitled Resting in Christ. Hmm, Resting in Christ. This is lesson number four in that series for uh, July 24 of 2021, entitled The Cost of Rest. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, it is our privilege to think about you, to associate with your son and his ways and livings and so forth long ago, to think about what the disciples did, but also to look to stories of others in the Bible. And this time to talk a little bit about some of the experiences of David. May we learn from those mistakes and not make them ourselves is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The cost of rest. Does that sound like sort of a contradiction in experience? We usually think that rest is supposed to be something you just experience, right? Well, this lesson will focus on the sin of David with Bathsheba and its consequences and they were, they were considerable. Uh, many people seem desperate to find a little peace and quiet. They are willing to pay for it too. In many big cities, there are internet free rooms which can be rented by the hour. The rules are strict, no noise, no visitors. People are willing to pay to be able to sit quietly and just think or nap. There are sleep pods that can be rented in airports and noise reducing earphones are popular items. I love mine, I can tell you. There are even canvas hoods or collapsible privacy shields that you can buy to put over your head and torso for a quick workplace break. Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Sabbath July 17. Well, our story begins with the story about David, his experiences. 2 Samuel 11.5, King David, who had fought many, many battles in his life, and we need to be honest here, what had happened is he got a little, a little older, and he'd been so successful at winning battles everywhere, the, the military started thinking, you know, if we have David with us, we can't possibly lose. And then they thought, well, what would happen if he went to one of our battles, and he got injured or killed, we wouldn't have him. So they told him to stay home. Because we, this is an easy battle. We can, we can handle this one. We don't need you. This is not a huge battle. You stay home. Well, he had fought many battles in his life and decided that time, the time at that particular time to send his general Joab, one of his uncles, to lead his army against the Ammonites. Meanwhile, back at home, David was resting, taking an afternoon nap, and then walking on his roof, roof he looked over and saw a very beautiful woman taking a bath. Jim, can you handle that? 2 Samuel 11, verses 1 to 5. The following spring, at the time of the year when kings usually go to war, David sent out Joab with his officers and the Israelite army. They defeated the Ammonites and besieged the city of Rabbah. But David himself stayed in Jerusalem. One day, late in the afternoon, David got up from his nap and went to the palace, having a to the, the pa palace, palace roof. Palace roof. Yeah. The to the palace roof. As he walked about up there, he saw a woman having a bath. She was very beautiful. So he sent a messenger to find out who she was, and learnt that she was Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. David sent messengers to fetch her. They brought her to him, and he made love to her. She had just finished her monthly ritual of purification. Then she went back home. Afterwards, she discovered that she was pregnant and sent a message to David to tell him. American Bible Society, 1992. Mm. Wow. Okay. What do we know about Uriah and Bathsheba? Carrie? Reading from 2 Samuel, chapter 23, verses 24 and 39. 
Other members of the 30, and in brackets, David's most powerful and effective fighting man, included Uriah the Hittite. Okay, so in that chapter, let's just fill that in. I skipped over a whole bunch of names there that we probably couldn't even pronounce correctly. But one of the last ones in that list, verse 39, was Uriah the Hittite. So he was recognized by David, handpicked by David, as being a very, very effective soldier. And he wasn't even a Jew. Yes. He was a Hittite. Okay? Second Samuel, verse 34, uh, chapter 23. Eliam, Bathsheba's father, son of Ahithophel from Gilo, was also a part of the 30. Okay, He's so right. now you see we have Bathsheba's father was Eliam, and her grandfather was Ahithophel. Ahithophel. And Myra, why don't you pick up there in First Chronicles 27? Let's get a little more detail. If I can say those words, you may have to fill in the names for me. Absalom. No, Ahithophel. Uh, oh, that's right. Uh, First Chronicles 27. 27, 33. 33. Uh, Ahithophel. Okay. Was advisor to the king. And Hushai. Hushai, the Archite. Archite, was the king's friend and counselor. Okay, so here it is. We, so David's, one of David's closest counselors was Ahithophel. And his son, Eliam, was over fighting. This was Bathsheba's father, was over fighting in the war over against the Ammonites. Her husband, so her father and her husband are over there fighting. She's home, bathing in the backyard. Okay. Second Samuel 16, Gordon, you want to take that on? Absalom and all the Israelites with him entered Jerusalem, and Ahithophel was with them. When Hushai, David's trusted friend, met Absalom, he shouted, long live the king, long live the king. Now, I, we need to back up for just a second and say that as David was fleeing from Jerusalem, as Absalom was bringing his forces in, he had talked to these two gentlemen. Here, Ahithophel was his, his, one of his trusted counselors, and Hushai was another one. And Hushai remained loyal to David, but Ahithophel decided he thought that Absalom was going to be the next king, so he was going to join uh, Absalom's group. And so that's where we are. And Absalom is one of David's sons. Absalom was one of David's sons. And a rascal. Absalom, yeah. Absalom, he shouted, long live the king, long live the king. What has happened to your loyalty to your friend David? Absalom asked him. Why didn't you go with him? Hushai answered, how could I? I am on the side of the one chosen by the Lord for these people and by all the Israelites, I will stay with you. So who can go against yeah, God's Yahweh? Choice. Yeah. After all, whom should I serve if not my master's son? As I served your father, so now I will serve you. Then Absalom turned to Ahithophel and said, now that we are here, what do you advise us to do? So now here they are, they're in Jerusalem. He, David has fled. They're there, and he's turning to these two former chief counselors of David. Okay? Ahithophel answered, Go and have intercourse with your father's concubines, whom he left behind to take care of the palace. Okay, so what's going on here? The, there were a group of young women who sometimes slept with David probably, therefore they were called concubines, and they were left, they didn't flee with David, they were left to take care of the palace. And now, if Absalom comes and takes, assumes these concubines as his wives, quote unquote, then what does that mean? He's the king. He's the king. As the next line says, then everyone in Israel will know that your father regards you as his enemy and your followers will, will be greatly encouraged. So they set up a tent for Absalom on the palace roof. And in sight of everyone, Absalom went in and had intercourse with his father's concubines. Is wow. this an R-rated program? <laughs> <laughs> Triple any, X or something. Any advice that Ahithophel gave in those days was accepted as though it had, were the very word of God. Both David and Absalom followed it. 
And we should say, now may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. <laughs> Amen. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. <clears throat> well, is it, was it the truth? It's exactly the truth. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. Later, when Ahithophel, who had endorsed Absalom, found out that Absalom had ignored his counsel and he decided to follow the counsel of Hushai instead, he committed suicide. 2 Samuel 17, 23, when Ahithophel saw that his advice had not been followed, even though, remember, we just read that his advice was considered to be equal to the word of God. But in this case, Absalom didn't follow it. He, Ahithophel saddled his donkey and went back to his own city. After putting his affairs in order, he hanged himself. He was buried in the family grave. What in the world is going on there? Notice of Bath. Now this is this is Bathsheba's grandfather. Notice that Bathsheba was the wife of one of David's most famous fighting men and the granddaughter of his most trusted counselor. David had taken on other men's wives before, including Abigail. What's the story of Abigail? First Samuel twenty-five. Remember, her husband was Nabal, a very very selfish and crude man. David's uh, soldiers had tried, protected his flocks for a long period of time, and so David asked him to partially support them, and this guy said, what do I have to do with this guy, and so forth, and he got drunk one night, and four days later he was dead, and David did what? Married his wife. And what else? And the wives of Saul? Carrie? Reading from Second Samuel chapter 12, verses 7 through 8. And this is what the Lord God of Israel says. I made you king of Israel and rescued you from Saul. I gave you his kingdom and his wives. I made you king over Israel and Judah. If this had not been enough, I would have given you twice as much. Okay. Does that mean twice as many wives? <laughs> so... David had done the same thing that Absalom, with Saul's wives, concubines, as Absalom did with... Yeah. It was automatic. It was sort of assumed that yeah. when the next king comes along, he takes over the wives of the former king. Yeah. David had killed other men before. You know, I, just look at one of these verses, 1 Chronicles 28, 2 and 3. David stood before them and addressed them, My friends, listen to me. I wanted to build a permanent home for the covenant box, the footstool of the Lord our God. I have made preparations for building a temple to honor him. But he has forbidden me to do it because I am a soldier and have, spit, and have, spit, have shed too much blood. Wow. And with this history behind him and recognizing his position as king, David felt that the rules that applied to others didn't apply to him. But there are some very interesting questions surrounding this whole story. I want you to think about this very carefully. All of you out there, I want you to think about this. How are we to explain the fact that Bathsheba was the wife of a vigorous fighting man and yet she had never been pregnant? If she had children, the encounter with David would never have happened. She would not have been out there on the backyard uh, taking a bath by herself. So how many years was she married to, uh, to uh, Uriah? We don't know. Never pregnant? Hmm. Then she has one encounter with David, and what happens? She's pregnant. So vigorous fighting men are not necessary. well, can still be sterile. But, but what about David? Yeah. And if, if Uriah had gone home to sleep with his wife, David's plans might have succeed, succeeded without detection. Did God arrange all this so that David would get caught? Or did the devil arrange that? Or was it just, just David's bad judgment? Well, but he thought he had a plan. None of his plans worked out. Then David was in a real dilemma. What was he going to do? 2 Samuel 11, uh, verses 6 to 27. David sent a message to Joab. 
Send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent him to David. When Uriah arrived, David asked him if Joab and the troops were well and how the fighting was going. Then he said to Uriah, Go home and rest a while. Uriah left, and David sent a present to his home. But Uriah did not go home. Instead, he slept at the palace gate with the king's guards. When, Uriah, when David heard that Uriah had not gone home, he asked him, You have just returned after a long absence. Why didn't you go home? Uriah answered, The men of Israel and Judah are away at war, and the covenant box is with them. My commander Joab and his officers are camping out in the open. How could I go home, eat, drink, and sleep with my wife? But all that's... By that's, all that's sacred. By all that's sacred, I swear that I could never do such a thing. So they took the covenant box, you know, into battle. Isn't that what... Isn't that what Samuel's sons did and got in so much trouble? Well, Eli's sons. Eli's, yeah, that's right, Eli's yeah. sons, I'm sorry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But when God, God sometimes told them to do that. And so apparently they thought that was what they were supposed to do. They, the idea was Jericho, that if, they, if they, you they, take the ark with you, then that's supposed to guarantee the fact that you'll win the battle. God, God's but here. How my question is, God? he said, no, I have to be faithful to Joab and the other men that are over there fighting. What about being faithful to your wife? I mean, did he even say hi to her? Yeah. She was just a woman. Well, as the story goes on, and Joab didn't need any enemies, did he? He had David for a friend. <laughs> okay. So David said, Then stay here and rest the day, and tomorrow I'll send you back. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next. David invited him to supper and made him drunk. Another but, great example. But again that night, Uriah did not go home. Instead, he slept on his blanket in the palace guardroom. The next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it to Uriah. He, he sent put, it by Uriah. Sent by Uriah. He wrote, put Uriah in the front line where the fighting is the heaviest. Then retreat and let him be killed. Now, I thought about this as I was working on this lesson. Are we to assume that Uriah doesn't know how to read? It's a sealed envelope. Is it? I assumed. Maybe. You know, the king's seal on it. Anyway, go ahead. Um, where was I? So while Joab... So while Joab was besieging the city... He sent Uriah to a place where he knew the enemy was strong. The enemy troops came out of the city and fought Joab's forces. Some of David's officers were killed, and so was Uriah. If the king asks you this, tell him, your officer Uriah was also killed. This is, he's, he's, this is Joab's Joab. instructions to the person who's going back to, to Jerusalem. When Bathsheba heard that her husband had been killed, she mourned for him. When the time of mourning was over, David sent for her to come to the palace, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the Lord was not pleased with what David had done. Surprise. And so the Lord killed the son. Is that well, what it says? No. Did not David have the option of sending Bathsheba? Oh, I'm sorry. David did not have the option of sending Bathsheba to the doctor to get an abortion, as many would want to do in our day. He launched into an elaborate scheme to try to cover up his sin. But God, or the devil, was not going to allow David to get away with that cover-up. So what happened next? 2 Samuel 12. The Lord sent the prophet Nathan to David. Nathan went to him and said, There were two men who lived in the same town. One was rich and the other poor. The rich man had many cattle and sheep, while the poor man had one lamb which he had bought. He took care of it, and it grew up in his home with his children. He would feed it with some of his own food, <clears throat> let it drink from his cup, and hold it in his lap. The lamb was like a daughter to him. One day a visitor arrived at the rich man's home. 
The rich man didn't want to kill one of his own animals to prepare, prepare a meal for him. Instead, he took the poor man's lamb and cooked a meal for his guest. David was very angry with the rich man and said, I swear by the living Lord that the man who did this ought to die. For having done such a cruel thing, he must pay back four times as much as he took. You are that man, Nathan said to David, and this is what the Lord God of Israel says. I made you king of Israel and rescued you from Saul. I gave you his kingdom and his wives. That says it again. Yep. I made you king over Israel and Judah. If this had not been enough, I would have given you twice as much. Why then have you disobeyed my commands? <clears throat> Why did you do this evil thing? You had Uriah killed in battle. Ooh, his, his uh, scheme was in no. the open. You let the Amorite, Ammonites kill him, and then you took his wife. Now in every generation, some of your descendants will die a violent death because you have disobeyed me and have taken Uriah's wife. I swear to you that I will cause someone from your own family to bring trouble on you. You will see it when I take your wives from you and give them to another man, to your son. Yes. And he will have intercourse with them in broad daylight. You sinned in secret, but I will make this happen in broad daylight for all Israel to see. I have sinned against the Lord, David said. Nathan replied, the Lord forgives you and you will not die. But because you have shown such contempt for the Lord in doing this, your child will die. Okay, and was that fair to the baby? David had been trapped into pronouncing his own death sentence. Nathan managed to tell a story that led David into that trap. Try to imagine David's emotions at that moment when Nathan says, you are that man. The blood just kind of... <laughs> did, he, did he fall dead, yeah. faint dead away? Should have. One of the challenges Bible scholars have struggled with in re respect to this story is found in 2 Samuel 12, 13 and Psalm 51, 4. Now we're going to talk about the, the second half to, of this lesson. What was David's response? And what does it? Let's just look at one of those. I'm just going to read one of those places. Psalm 51, verse 4. I have sinned against you, only against you. And he's praying to God. Um, and done what you consider evil. So you're right in judging me. You are justified in condemning me. I have sinned only against you. He arranged for the death of Uriah. I haven't sinned against Uriah. I haven't sinned against Bathsheba. I haven't sinned against the nation. No. Why would David say he'd sinned only against the Lord? Was it because Uriah was gone, dead, and he had already married Bathsheba? Or was it because David was more concerned about his relationship with God? Um, the prophet's rebuke, I'm sorry, this would be mine if I can get my computer to go here. The prophet's rebuke touched the heart of David. Conscience was aroused. His guilt appeared in all its enormity. His soul was bowed in penitence before God. With trembling lips he said, I have sinned against the Lord. All wrong done to others reaches back from the injured one to God. David had committed a grievous sin toward both Uriah and Bathsheba, and he keenly felt this, but infinitely greater was his sin against God. Patriarchs and Prophets 722, paragraph 1. It's interesting to note that Nathan immediately assured David that he was forgiven. How was Nathan so sure, so certain that God would forgive David? Clearly, Nathan had been told by God about a number of the consequences that would occur because of David's sin. So somewhere in that revelation from God to Nathan, did he say that David would be forgiven? Apparently, forgiveness isn't the ultimate. It's, there's consequences to actions. Well, let's see where we go from there. Before this whole sordid story was over, four of David's sons died. 
Um, I, we don't have time to read all these passages, but there are four sons. Remember that Amnon died because Absalom killed him for raping Absalom's sister. Now all of them, all three of them were children of David. But Amnon, the, Amnon who should have been the king following David, he was the eldest son. And he fell in love with, he became just, you know, enamored with Absalom's sister. And then he raped her, made this whole elaborate plan and raped her. And then Absalom arranged to kill Amnon for having done that. And then what happened to Absalom? After he tried to set himself up as king and chase David out of the town and so forth, down in the battle in the heavy wooded area down alongside the Jordan, he ended up getting his long hair, flowing hair, caught in a, in a tree limb, and the donkey or horse apparently left him hanging there. Yeah. Kept on going. Wasn't it Joab that came and killed him? I think so. Yeah. And I then think these people are were. Uh, yep. You got friends like that. You, yeah. you are not looking for enemies. Yeah. And, and finally, the loyalties are just. Uh, short-lived. And the last one was Adonijah, and he was the one who expected to be the next king. Psalm 51 records David's earnest prayer to God about his sin. And let's look at that. Psalm 32, by the way, is something similar. Jim? Psalms 51, verses 1 to 6. Be merciful to me, O God, because of your constant love. Because of your great mercy, wipe away my sins. Wash away all my evil, and make me clean from my sin. I recognize my faults. I am always conscious of my sins. I have sinned against you, only against you, and done what you consider evil. So you are right in judging me. You are justified in condemning me. I have been evil from the day I was born, from the time I was conceived. I have been sinful, sincerely and truth, excuse me, sincerity and truth, or what you would require, fill my mind with your wisdom. Good News Bible. Okay. David must have understood and appreciated already what it was like to stand in a right relationship with God. Now, what did God call him back in the days when he was first calling, first calling him to be king? A man after my own heart. A man after my own heart. So apparently David, already, he knew, he had already experienced what it was like to be in right relationship with God. So here in Psalm 51, he was praying for a return to that right relationship. When we consider the cost of rest in Jesus, we need to first to recognize that we need outside help. We are sinners and need a Savior. We recognize our sins and cry out to the only Christ, I'm sorry, the only one who can wash us, cleanse us, and renew us. When we do this, we can take courage. Here is an adulterer, a manipulator, a murderer, and someone who violated at least five of the Ten Commandments, who called for help and claimed the promise of God's forgiveness. I don't know that we should be looking to David as a great example, but if we're in trouble, why, well, yeah, maybe it's a good place to look. Only in his younger days was he a man after God's own heart. Well, but later, at the very end of his life, he apparently got back close to that, but having been through some really rough times. Perhaps one of the most important reasons for including in Scripture these two chapters dealing with David's sin is the hope it gives for those of us who find ourselves caught in sin. I mean, wouldn't it have just been a lot easier and raised a lot less questions if God had just left these two chapters out? Just cut about, them out. How about leaving this whole story about yeah. David and Bathsheba out? Yeah. yeah. That would have been a good way to go, wouldn't it? So what did David say as he continued his prayer? Carrie? Uh, this is from Psalm 51, verses 7 through 12. Remove my sin and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear the sounds of joy and gladness. And though you have crushed me and broken me, I will be happy once again. Close your eyes to my sins and wipe out all my evil. Create a pure heart in me, O God, and put a new and loyal spirit in me. Do not banish me from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. Give me again the joy that comes from your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Again from the Good News Bible. 
It's interesting that the words Holy Spirit here are capitalized in some versions, but not in others. Why do you suppose that is? I don't know. It probably depends upon, well, the word is probably vague in the uh, Hebrew. It could be. And some don't believe in the Holy Spirit being That's also, Godhead. That's also possible. Is it talking about a particular person who's, who David is asking for help, or is he talking about God's Spirit, which is holy? Spirit of truth. Spirit of truth. There's another possibility. Did David fully understand the joy and gladness associated with an innocent service to God? Was it unreasonable for David to ask God to restore that relationship with him? Is it all right for us to go, ask God to do things for us? Is it all right to pray for things that God has promised for, to, do, to give us? Think of Adam and Eve and their experience after sinning in the Garden of Eden. Were they just absolutely repentant and sorrowful for what they had done? No, they were trying to hide from God's presence. Contrast David's story here in Psalm 51. So what is it that separates us from God? Well, Isaiah 59, 2 says, It is because of your sins that he does not hear you. It is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship him. So what's the separating wall between us and God? Refusal to listen is one way. Yeah, Sin. our sins. David was very anxious to restore a right relationship with God. He knew that in every aspect of his life, even including fighting battles against the enemies, his enemies, he could not accomplish anything without God's help. I mean, think of what God did for him when he was running from Saul. A victorious Christian life is not about us and how hard we struggle. It is about how often we allow God into our thoughts to transform our characters. So, now let's be clear about this. How is it that a sinful, mortal human being can be changed into a saint? How does that happen? Can we do that on our own? No. We cannot. The only way we can accomplish that is not even right to say, can we allow that to happen, is by opening up our minds, calling God's Spirit in, asking the angels to help us, they can make the changes in our, in our thinking, in our minds. We can't make those changes. David cried out for God to create a new heart within him. And God, you know, 2 Corinthians 3.18, by beholding we become changed. Can you think of any sins that you have committed of which you are not sure that you have been forgiven? There's a good question. Remember how, what we were taught when we were kids? Boy, if you don't get that slate wiped clean at the end of every day, you're in trouble. I remember the uh, one person that we both know from a Bible study who said if he was to go, it wanted to be right after confession. Yep. So that the slate would be clean. Yes. Does the example of David encourage you to seek to restore the best possible relationship with God? I hope so. Humanly speaking, the most natural thing for us to do after having committed a sin and believing that we have been forgiven is to try to forget it. Sometimes memories are painful. But compare another portion of David's prayer. Continuing in Psalms 51, Then I will teach sinners your commands, and they will turn back to you. Spare my life, O God, and save me, and I will gladly proclaim your, your righteousness. Help me to speak, Lord, and I will praise you. You do not want sacrifices, or I would offer them. You are not pleased with burnt offerings. My sacrifice is a humble spirit, O God. You will not reject a humble and repentant heart. O God, be kind to Zion and help her. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be pleased with proper sacrifices and with our burnt offerings, and bulls will be sacrificed on your altar. Is that what God wants? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> that's a good question. Um, probably the answer to that is, is, the best answer to that is found over in the book of Romans. 
But he, he said just before that, you do not want sacrifices, so why does You he... want my humble spirit. Yeah. Micah 6, mm -hmm. 6 through 8. Yeah, yeah. Micah yeah. 6, 6 through 8. So what? Yeah. This, is, this was Paul's response to that. So then my brothers and sisters... Where are you reading from? I'm reading from Romans 12, 1 and 2. Because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, not dead animals, a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to His service and pleasing to Him. This is the true worship that you should offer. Okay? So that's what David, I mean, that's what Paul recommended, and I think he's, he's thinking about this verse. You do not want sacrifices, I would offer them. You are not pleased with burnt offerings. My sacrifice is a humble spirit. That would be a living sacrifice, right? Wouldn't there be also be a willingness to listen? Yeah, of course, yes. When a, when a bull or a precious vase falls and breaks into pieces, we normally sigh and throw the useless broken pieces away. In Japan, there's a traditional art called kintsugi, which specializes in recreating broken pottery. A precious metal, such as liquid gold or silver, is used to glue the broken pieces together and to turn the broken item into something of beauty and value. Wow. So, God can do that of our lives. We cannot repair ourselves. We cannot undo our past sins. God's books, quote unquote, in heaven, in heaven record every detail of every single life that has ever existed. What we can do is to restore a right relationship with our God and try to live better in the future with His help. What is relationship, what relationship do you see between Psalm 51 and 1 John 1, 9? 1 John 1, 9. But if we confess our sins to God, He will keep His promise and do what is right. He will forgive us our sins and purify us from all wrongdoing. Isn't that kind of a summary for Psalm 30, 51? It is no problem for God to forgive us. He is forgiveness personified. Remember, Jesus begged His Father to forgive the people who are nailing Him to the cross. There is one possible problem with reading and rereading Psalm 51 and 1 John 1, 9. One possible problem, let's think about it. If we become obsessed with our past sins by beholding, we become changed into the likeness of our past sins. We should not be focusing on our past sins, we should be focusing on Jesus and how He can help us to live better lives in the future. Jim? David's repentance was sincere and deep. There was no effort to palliate, palliate his, crime. his crime, no desire to escape the judgment threatened, excuse me, the judgments threatened, inspired by his, in his prayer. He saw the defilement of his soul. He loathed his sin. It was not by pardon alone, excuse me, pardon only that he prayed, but for purity of heart. In the promises of God to repentant sinners, he saw the evidence of his pardon and acceptance. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Psalms 51, verses 16 and 17. Though David had fallen, the Lord lifted him up. David humbled himself and confessed his sin, while Saul despised reproof and hardened his heart in, in impenitence. This passage in David's history is one of the most forcible illustrations given us of the struggles and temptations of humanity and of genuine repentance. Through all the ages, thousands of children of God who have been betrayed into sin have remembered David's sincere repentance and confession, and they also have taken courage to repent and try to, again, to walk in the way of God's commandments. Let me interrupt there for a second. How many, how many people do you think have, have been helped by learning, by reading and studying Psalm 51? Have you ever had the experience of saying, boy, I'm glad 
that verse is in there. It gives me it gives me courage to ask God for help. Don't we get a a, a good picture about of God in the, in that passage? Yeah. You know, even if it's a, not a good picture of David particularly. No, but, but it shows how, how gracious God is, how merciful God is. We, um, Dr. Maxwell used to, who some of us know quite well, attended many of his classes, used to talk about this story. He says he's looking forward to the time when we get to heaven. And David will be there, and there will be Bathsheba standing beside him, and up will come Uriah. How are you? Well, oh, this is my wife. This is whose wife? And oh, here's Solomon. Well, where did he come from? Well, uh, he's uh, 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 a. <laughs> There's going to be some interesting... Stuttering and stammering? <laughs> There's going to be some interesting occasions in, in heaven when we meet certain people that we know about. And, you know, I, this is one of the times when I stop and ask people. Um, there's many people who believe that just miraculously all trace of, of sin is going to be eliminated. When we get to heaven, no one is going to remember anything about sin. Well, if that's true... We're going to have to get rid of the Bibles. The Bible is going to be a great Bible burning at the gate of the New Jerusalem because oh, this what David and Uriah will not need the Bible for this story. <laughs> <laughs> well, Uriah might need the Bible for the re the second half of the story. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And what do you think David would say to Uriah under those? What, what, what he should have said to you know, to Bathsheba for that matter, but. What, 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 what's David going to say to Uriah in heaven? Well, hopefully I've they changed. remember where they are. <laughs> and no fighting is allowed. <laughs> uh, he's going to say, I've changed. I'm no yeah. longer that David that uh, took, killed you and took your wife in reverse order. And Uriah will say... You're forgiven? Well, he, he can't do the forgiving, but he, I suppose he can, but, I mean... No. He can say, I understand that you're changed, yeah. and yeah. I'll, I'll wait and see for you to confirm it. Will, will he try to say, well, make an excuse for saying, well, you didn't really kill me, Dave, but it was the Ammonites who killed me. Yeah, well. Would he try to explain it that way? But David if he's honest, will say, but I had your uh, general pull back so that you would be killed. Boy. I okay. intended for you to be killed. Yeah. Okay, sorry for the interruptions. Go ahead. Whoever will humble the soul with confession and repentance, as did David, may be sure that there is hope for him. The Lord will never cast away one truly repentant soul. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 725 and 6. Okay. God wants to treat each of us as if we are a son or a daughter of the King of the universe. That's how God wants to treat each one of us. Does He really want to treat us that way despite our sinfulness? I mean, if sin separate, God wants us to be his faithful children. He loves every one of us. And then here comes our sins that separate us from God. How does that make God feel? Must be really sad. Yeah. Would it be correct to say that ultimately all sin is against God? And what would that mean if we said that? I mean, think about it. There, there would be none of this kind of stuff we're talking about here in this lesson if it weren't for sin. But you have, God has made it possible for everybody to have the freedom to make choices. Yeah. And there's consequences to choices. And loyalty, if you don't want to listen to the Creator, you listen to other ways of, of philosophies or whatever, and, and uh, they have if disastrous you, consequences. If you happen to go on to YouTube once in a while and you look up um, stories that, of people 
talking about the Bible and explaining things in the Bible and so forth, every once in a while you run across something like what I ran across today, where there's a someone who's taking the Bible side and then he's in discussion with someone who's, who absolutely claims that he's an atheist and he has all this evidence from the Bible saying these are the reasons why nobody should believe what the Bible says. So now, suppose we had an atheist sitting here talking about this story. What would you say to him about this story? Does it sound like a good Christian story? This shows what God can take people like this and change them into wholesome people. There's been millions and millions of innocent people who have died one way or another just because of their beliefs, for example. Um, what about acts of God? Are they truly acts of God, you know, the insurance policy? No. Is that the way God behaves? No. What's a, what would be the purpose? To coerce a person, uh, extort behavior? Yeah. I mean, that's it's, it's contrary to love. Well, through the ages, millions of innocent victims have died because of sin. We live in a dangerous and vicious world, again, because of sin. It is essential that we recognize the issues in the great controversy in order to make sense of all this. Do we recognize fully the implications of Isaiah 59:2? It is our sins that separate us from God. Do we really recognize that? So what are we, every time we commit a sin, what are we doing? We're saying to God, stand back, leave me alone, I'm busy sinning right now. Another way you could say it, that a person has chosen a, another leader in their life. You know, and, and God's not gonna force himself on you. If you want to, that's what, what, did, what did Eve do with, uh, with the serpent? She chose to listen to, to the... What ideas and what emotions come into your mind when you review this sordid story about King David and Bathsheba? One of the very important things that we learn from this story is that forgiveness did not prevent the terrible consequences of David's sin. Not only did David suffer, but also four of his sons died. Was that punishment sent by God? Or was it the consequence of David's children seeing his behavior and mimicking it? We don't even know how many wives David had and how many children he had by those many wives. And how and much influence did he really have on those? I, I had the privilege of working in Africa for a number of years. And I, one of the things I did while I was there was teach some classes of young people about the Bible and the stories of the Bible and so forth. And one day one of those young men came to me and said to me, he said, you know, he said, my father was a polygamist. Because it, it's, that's legal in, in, in Africa and those animist, animistic societies. Uh, my father's a polygamist. And what we knew about our father was he would come around often drunk to see our mother, and she would, you know, because she didn't feel up to disciplining us herself, she would, as soon as he would show, well, you've got to deal, you know, this is my son, and this is what he's done since the last time you were here, and then the father's job was to punish him as hard as he could to try to prevent him from doing that again. I mean, how would you feel about your father? Would it have been better for God to have leave, left this story out of the Bible? Yeah. Consider the four lessons which we can learn from this story. One, David should have been out on the battlefield doing what God had called him to do. When we fail to follow God's directions, Satan is more than happy to suggest other possibilities. Was David supposed to be out on the battlefield killing? Well... Or evangelizing? Yeah, that would have been nice if it were possible. That, that seemed to be, I mean, God certainly blessed him. He conquered the territory from Egypt to the Euphrates. Satan's, too, Satan's temptations attack us when they are least expected. And that's so sad, you know. Just when you think everything's going fine, boom. Where did that come from? 
Three, at times we may feel that we have successfully covered up our sins, but sin can never be covered up for long. And here's a comment from way back in the days of Moses, Numbers 32, 23. Moses told the people, but if you do not keep your promise, I warn you that you will be sinning against the Lord. Make no mistake about it, you will be punished for your sins. Or as the modern English version has that verse, be sure your sins will do what? Find you out. Find you out. Be sure your sins will find you out. Yeah, okay. David may have wept, confessed his sin, repented of his evil deed, and he was forgiven by God. And if you read the story, how long did he, he, he wept for what, two weeks for this first, this Bathsheba's first child. And finally, the baby died. Well, I guess it's not gonna do any good to weep anymore. The people that, what? You know, you're weeping, you were praying, you were doing all fasting, all this kind of stuff. Now the child's dead and you're not gonna, well, he's dead now. David may have wept, confessed his sin, etc. However, the consequences of sin remained. Sin is like cancer in many ways. And here's a famous story about a famous person. Edwin Cooper was famous across America, yet almost no one knew his real name. Coming from a family of circus clowns, Cooper began performing before audiences when he was just nine years old. After a stint with the Barnum & Bailey Circus, he became a fixture on television in the 1950s as Bozo the Clown. And who hasn't heard of Bozo, at least here in America? In addition to entertaining both young and old, Cooper had a message for his, quote, buddies and partners. Every week, get checked for cancer. Yet Cooper was so busy working that he would neglect it to follow his own advice. By the time his cancer was discovered, it was too late for it to be treated. Edwin Cooper died at just 41 years of age from a disease he had warned many others to watch out for. Well, we know sin is far more deadly than the most aggressive and fast-growing cancer. This one can kill you forever. Sin kills and destroys everything it touches. From the fall of Adam in the Garden of Eden until now, sin takes no prisoners. This is the purpose behind everything Satan does. And, and think about this. I mean, I, yeah, I, I think that in order to really understand things, we need, to, we need to try to think of both sides. So I try sometimes to think like Satan, see what, how it, I mean, what motivates that character? I mean, we've heard statements like, misery loves company. I mean, is that what motivates him? I, I, I don't know. This is, uh, um, what, this is the purpose behind everything that Satan does. Jesus said, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy, John 10.10. 10. Because of his evil nature and his hatred of everything good, the devil brings destruction to everything within his reach. This is no laughing matter. That was the name of the article in a journal called Reading Eagle, July 5, 1961. And you can still access it on the internet if you choose to look it up. In addition to the death of Bathsheba's first son, David lived to see the death of both Amnon, who had raped his sister, who was Absalom's sister, and Absalom, which, who tried to take David's place. He did not live to see the fulfillment of 1 Kings 2, 1 to 25. We don't have time to read that now, but this is a case that Adonijah, what, what did Adonijah want to do? Do you remember? All he wanted to do was marry David's hot water bottle. Yeah. Innocent. Innocent. When the eldest son, uh, so in addition to the death of Bathsheba, David lived to see the death of both Amnon and Absalom. He did not live to see the fulfillment of 1 Kings 2, 1 to 2, 25. When the eldest remaining son of David, by the name of Adonijah, thought he should be the next king, he humbly permitted, and he was making arrangements to set up a place so he could be, you know, the next king. And then all of a sudden, what happened? Do you remember? Bathsheba went to David and said, didn't you promise me that my son Solomon would be the next king? 
and that God had told him that that was true. And so David set about making Solomon his... So Adonijah was, you know, he was not really happy, but Adonijah thought that he should be the next king. He humbly permitted Solomon to take the throne when David said, that's the one I want to be my follower, but asked to marry Abishag. David's former concubine. Remember the lady who'd been asked to sleep with him just to keep him warm? As a result, Solomon, fearing that Adonijah would seek to take the throne, arranged for his murder. Now, why would Adonijah think that, that David wanted, wanted to say, take his throne? I mean, Adonijah wanted to take his throne? Well, we've, heard, we've heard in this lesson about David sleeping with Saul's concubines or wives to declare that he was king and Absalom, Absalom and Absalom doing the same. There yeah. wasn't yeah. much harmony in that family, was there? <laughs> what should we learn from Psalm 51? This is certainly one of the most powerful prayers in all the Bible. It is hard not to accept the fact that David's repentance was full and deep. Notice specifically the actions David asked for in his prayer. He prays, have mercy upon me, blot out my transgressions, wash me, cleanse me. I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is always before me. Purge me, wash me, make me hear joy and gladness. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Do not cast me away from your presence. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and so forth. And let's, not, uh, let's stop for a moment now and think about what we've learned from this story. Here is a story of a terrible sin. David committed. David, the man who was originally called the man after God's own heart. But when he fell into this terrible trap, what was his response? He came out and he said, God, I am so sorry. And I would like to get back that kind of relationship with you that I, that I learned out there playing a harp and taking care of the sheep. And God, I mean, David was so concerned that he get back to that relationship that he was willing to give up anything for it. And so we read about all these things and the, the, the Psalms he wrote and so forth. And Jesus loves us. He wants every one of us to come back to him, no matter what our situation, no matter how helpless, how, how bad our conditions did. It is his glory to encircle us in the arms of his love and to bind up our wounds, to cleanse us from all impurity. So Jesus is appealing to each one of us to come back to him. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, it is our privilege to come to you, no matter what our circumstances have been, no matter what our current situation is, you are still waiting for us to come back. You love each one of us. Help us to respond to that love. And may we do so in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.